So I answered it anyway, I'm gonna share it with you. Some of you may find it important, some of them, some of you may find it not important, but definitely it may affect our walk, but there, there are a couple probably one that, that I believe will not affect our salvation and whatever we believe about this, okay? But, but I'll start out with the first question. You have, you have your outlines with you. I don't know if uh, Ati Susan and Dom Jeff, do you have the outlines? The guide, no? Are we able to send Dr. Jeff and Ati Susan the guide? Okay, so Bell is gonna send you. Uh, if you have the if you have the midweek group meeting, it's up. It's already there. It's a link on the FCF group meeting. If not, uh, Bell's gonna send you for the what do you call this? The outline for that. The guide for tonight's study. So we're gonna go to the first question. Again, that was asked last Sunday during the devotion of the worship team, and I think it's an important thing. Uh, to to share, although I gave the gist of it, um, I because they were in the middle of devotion when that was asked, um, I did not have a chance to give the references and really go to the reference verses. But what we what we're gonna do is do that more extensively tonight. Okay, so and this is the first question on your guide. Are we there's a filler there? There's a filler there, so you may wanna fill that up. Okay, once once you get but once you get the word, are we or are we not going to see God? Okay, are we or are we not going to see God? Why the question? Why did the question arise? Because their devotion for it was from the first book of Timothy, chapter six. But I, I know that the celebration team instead of reading the suggested like uh, segment of the chapter. They, they go through the entire chapter when they have a devotion. So because of that, they encountered that particular verse which is found in First Timothy 6, 15 and 16. Okay, First Timothy, it's especially in verse 16, but we're gonna go look at those two verses. So if you have your Bibles with you, um, I'm encouraging you to please go prepare and we're gonna read um, the verses from the New Living Translation. So join, everybody join there, it's Bible study. So I want us to be really more familiar with opening our Bibles, going through the scriptures, so we know we're, we're tackling the right thing and that we have the foundation for what we're believing in. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, 15 through 16, this is what it says. I'm going to read to you the very first word, ver, ver, verses for tonight. It says, For at just the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and only Almighty God the King of all kings and Lord of all lords. He alone can never die. And he lives in light so brilliant that no human can approach him. No human eye has ever seen him, nor ever will. Okay? All honor and power to him forever. Amen. So that part... Uh, that says no human eye has ever seen him, nor ever will, was the verse of questioning, okay? Now, let me, let me, last Sunday I said that's not a standalone verse. For the fact that there may be other verses that, that are addressing the issue of whether or not we will see God face to face. So, but just to strengthen that point, that's not the only scripture. That's not the only scripture that talks about not seeing God. Okay, so now I'm going to invite you. Well, let's start with um, Marlene. Will you please read for us 1 John 4.12? Let's all go to 1 John 4.12, and we're going to ask Marlene to read that for us. Because th that part, no human eye has ever seen him. Nor ever will. Yes, confirmed by the scriptures. That's not a standalone verse that proves that we will not see him. Okay, First John four twelve. Go ahead, Martin. If you're there, please read it for us. Okay, First John four twelve. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and His love is brought to full expression in us. Okay, so we'll focus on, they related to each other, but we'll focus on the very first part of that verse, which has, can you read it again, the very first sentence? No one has ever seen God, but... Okay, that's it. No one 
has ever seen God. And that is from the book of 1 John, written by the oldest apostle who ever lived. So that means to say at that point in time, there were already Old Testament saints who have died, and there were New Testament saints who have already died. But even at that point, when we know there were Old, Old Testament saints who have died already, and New Testament saints who have already died, John claimed that no one has ever seen God, okay? No one has seen him, no human has ever seen him, nor ever will, and then here in this verse, no one has ever seen God, okay? There's an example in Exodus 33, verse 20, and I'm going to read now. Uh, let me see, Aubrey, would you please go to Exodus 33, 20? Everybody go there as well. And let's see from that example, okay, how it affirms that scripture as well. Exodus 33, verse 20. Exodus 33, 20. But you may not look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live. There you go. You may not look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live. So based on those scriptures, clearly it is easy to conclude that we can't really, and we won't, we can't and we won't see God, okay? Um, that's, it. they're not just implied, they're explicit. They are direct statements. But wait a minute, okay, so it sounds like a salesman, but wait a minute, hold on. Okay, in a few seconds, we're going to look at other verses okay, that may have something that seemingly opposes Okay, those thoughts. Okay, so I want us now to go to Matthew chapter five, verse eight. Well, I'm gonna read. I'm, I'm gonna read Matthew five verse eight because you're familiar with that anyway. From the Beatitudes, one of the parts in the Beatitudes says this: God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. See that explicitly saying the opposite of what John said where he said, you won't see God, or nobody has seen God. Jesus said, no one, or, I mean, Paul said, no one will see God. But here, Jesus was saying, God blesses those because, who are pure in heart because they will see God, okay? The next one is Genesis 32, verse 30. Genesis 32, verse 30. Um, Brian, would you please go read it first? Genesis 32, verse 30. Genesis 32, verse 30, Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God, for he said, I have seen God, um, for I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. Okay, there you go. So here's an example about Jacob after wrestling with the angel of God, concluded that that was not just an angel of God or the angel of God, that was God that I wrestled with, quote unquote, and I've seen God face to face. Okay, so. In Job 19, verses 26 and 27, my hear from Julia, will you please read that one for us? Oh, where is she? Okay. <laughs> She's not here. Okay. Let me see. May I have uh, Eddie, will you please read that for us? Job 19, 26 and 27. And after my body has decayed, in my body, I will see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. Okay, praise God. Verse 26. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body, I will see God. And at the very, I, this is like, he, he affirmed that repeatedly. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. Then it goes, I am overwhelmed at the thought. That's me. That's me. The thought of, the thought of seeing God face to face, I'm overwhelmed by that thought. I want to see him. I don't not want to see him. I want to see God. I love him. And I believe that's true with every one of us. So sometimes the thought of, are we really going to see God or not? And the thought of not seeing him is like devastating. But here it's saying that we are going to see him face to face. I'm going to see him with my own eyes. Okay, this way it's an overwhelming thought that we are actually going to have that experience. So now I can throw the question at everyone. Somebody may, somebody, somebody may have an opinion. Um, 
all of that, all of these, we're gonna we're gonna have uh, what we call hypotheses. All right, these are going to be intelligent guesses only if you want to share what you thought may be. So if you don't, um, I'm gonna give you some probable answers that I can, that I've come up with. So anybody would like to have uh, to share an idea, a hypothesis, an intelligent guess, an opinion as to what's going on here. On one part, they're all explicit, straightforward. We're not going to see God. On the other hand, on the other part, you're going to see God. So some people would look at this, by the way. This is the reason why we have to know how they complement each other. Can we come up with a theory or an interpretation that makes those two complement each other? Okay, so that's that's the challenge because people always see. I'm telling you, the Bible is full of contradictions, and we don't mm -hmm. believe that. Okay, anybody want to share? All right, nobody. I'm gonna go ahead. Okay, they just stop me when you have something to share. All right, so we could cover a lot more. So now, um, we cannot. Here's one probable answer. First probable answer. First probable. I think I could say we cannot, we can't and won't ever see him based on the description of 1 Timothy 6.16. You know, he says, right. he lives in light so brilliant that no human can approach him. I think we can't and won't ever see him in his quote unquote light so brilliant that no human can approach him form. In that essence, we're not going to see him. Why? Because John 4, 23 and 24, okay? John 4, 23 and 24. Um, Grace, would you please read that one for us? John 4, 23 and 24. I knew you were going to call me. But... <laughs> but you have a prophetic gift. <laughs> but the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. When true worshipful worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Okay, all right. So the essence, one of the essence of God is he is a spirit. He is a spirit. So why did I quote that? Why did I want to point that out? Because yeah. there's something that describes the spirit. Luke chapter 24. Uh, Doc Jeff, since you're already there, would you please go to Luke 24, verse 39? Mm -hmm. 24, 24 verse 39. Read that one for us. 24. Luke 24. 39. 39. 39. All right, hang on. We're cutting off. Yeah. Okay, 39. Going down here. Behold, my hands and my feet, that is, I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Okay, there you go. So here in Luke 24, 39, it's defined to us at least one definition about the spirit. It does not have flesh and bones. Right. You need to say the spirit does not have body. Okay. The spirit does not have a body. But, Pastor, can the spirit have a form? Well, you can conclude it that way. You're probably thinking about a smoke, right? Smoke, or you're thinking about, like, you think about ghosts, you're thinking about Casper. He still has a form. Okay, but, <laughs> quote, unquote, Casper is a friendly ghost. So, when you think about ghosts, sometimes you, you see, you're, you're, seeing, you're seeing some kind of mist. You're imagining something like that. But what does the Bible say? Because okay, so we talked about there's a there's a, an, an, he lives in an unapproachable light that's the first one that's why you cannot see him in that essence and then he is a spirit we just define as no body no flesh no bone but does he have a form or not we're not sure okay this this part by the way which says no no flesh and bones it, in some in some interpretations it is interpreted as no form having no form Okay, but there's another verse I'd like us to look at, which is in First Timothy chapter one, verse seventeen. And I'm gonna ask Julia now to please read for us. First Timothy one seventeen. 
value. Are you back? He's back. Make sure you unmute yourself. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. Again, please. 117? <laughs> yeah. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. Okay, we return to you because I didn't get that part. But, um, did everybody hear Julia Curie? Yeah, okay, but you have your Bible so good anyway. But that's, that's really it. There's a part there in that verse. And then come back. There's a part in that. Okay, there's a part in 1 Timothy 1, 17. So we saw he lives in an approachable light. He is a spirit. He is a spirit that does not have a body. He is a spirit in flesh. He's a spirit that does not have form. And some people will say, but it doesn't say it doesn't have form. He may have form, but in 1 Timothy 1, 17, it says he is the unseen. Okay, he is the unseen one. That's in living translation. In fact, in King James, the, the unseen one okay in fact in king james in king james it's rendered as now unto the king eternal immortal remember the one who never dies unto the king eternal immortal invisible okay so in the bible it directly says invisible so that explains in that essence of being a spirit that does not have a form or even would form, but he could not be approached. He lives in an approachable light and, uh, and he, he is invisible. How can we see him? That explains, that explains the reason why we can't see God in that essence. Okay. We're not, we're not finished. Yet, okay. So God is invisible. So now, but we've also read that we can see him. So how does that go along with this? I want us now to go to, let me see, I'm going to have only one person actually read this one. Uh, Paul, would you please read for us John 14, 7 through 9? John 14, 7 through 9. Okay, remember, it's, right now we've proven the reality of we cannot see God. He is invisible. Spirit who lives in un unapproachable light. Okay, now... We're going to look at the part where it says, can we see him? Can we see him? Okay, so here you go. If you had really known me, you would know who my father is. From now on, you will, or from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Fourteen, seven through nine, huh? Seven mm -hmm. through nine? Oh, seven through nine, sorry. Yeah. Seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Okay, all right. Can you read for us? Can you read for us 8 and 9 again, Paul? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Okay, hold on. Yes. Philip was asking for him to show the Father. Now listen carefully. At this point, there were many of his apostles who still did not grasp. Many of the people who follow Jesus still did not grasp the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when it refers to the Father, the common, I believe that the common understanding they had was God. It was God, okay? So when Peter, when Philip was asking, show us the Father, it's almost him saying, show us God, because many of them still did not recognize the Son of God as co-equal with his dad, okay? Many of them still have not accepted him as the Son, as, as divinity, 
okay? So now it's possible. I'm not saying it is dogmatic. It is possible when they say, show us the Father. What he was saying is, show us God. Okay, so now Jesus responds. Okay, I'll just read it. Jesus responds. Okay, it's like Philip was going, Lord, show us God. Okay, and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip? And you still don't know who I am. He goes, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And if you replace that with their ex possible expectation, you could replace that with whoever has seen me has seen God. See that? Okay. So why are you asking me to show him to you? So that's something that you want to pay attention to that in that, in that statement of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So at the same time, there are other verses here that I want to look at. Uh, Colossians 1.19, we haven't read yet. Maddie, uh, please read for us Colossians 1.19. You may all go there if you want to. Colossians 1.19, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. Okay. God in all his fullness dwells in lives in Jesus Christ, okay? There's another verse, Colossians 2.9. Colossians 2.9. John, would you please read that one for us? Colossians 2.9. One of my favorite verses um, in the Bible. Uh, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. There you go. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body i somehow there's a i like the little nuance in the in the the difference in the king james translation where it says for in him for in him that's christ dwelleth all the fullness of the godhead bodily so somehow some of the nuance that i see there is it's not just that god in his fullness lives in jesus it's almost like if you want to see god bodily Look at Jesus. Some of the King James has that kind of appearance. That's how I understood that when I first got introduced to that verse. Because it literally says the Godhead, by the way. You want to call it Trinity or Triune God? That's where it is, the Godhead. There is a Godhead. Okay, well, according to the New Living Translation, the fullness of God. Okay, so again, what does it say? We will see God based on that. We're not going to see God with a human eye. We're not going to see him in the essence of him living in an unapproachable light as a spirit without form, God who is invisible. But as the Bible teaches that there is a God invisible, the Bible also teaches that there is a God manifest invisibly. You got it. I want you to put that in your mind. I want you to impress that deeply in your heart, deeply in your heart, okay, and in your memory. There is a God who is invisible, but there's also a God who is manifested in a visible form. Okay, so both are true. Okay, that God in that essence, nobody can see him. But this God in this essence, we can see him. Okay, what is that? That's the reason why Colossians, um, is it, uh, did anybody, I'm going to look at you guys, did everybody understand that? Yes. With no question. If you did, everybody just say, wave your hand. Okay? If you understood that with no question, praise God. Okay? In fact, one of my, one of my favorite verses also in Colossians is in 1.15. Let me just read it to you. Colossians 1.15 says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. You got it? God is invisible. God is invisible. But through Christ, he becomes visible christ is the visible image of the invisible god there you go he existed before anything was created in the supreme overall creation so our focus is on the first part of that colossians 1 15. those are beautiful verses in colossians by the way colossians 1 19 colossians 2 9 colossians 1 15. beautiful okay so another possible answer okay possible answer uh, this one I got from like other sources, John Piper and um, 
other I, uh, as people I don't know, yeah, but but I try to like, what are the other answers they come up with? But many of them, I, I just put them all together. They, they go back to almost like very, very like common point. So the, another possible, an, possible answer is that we can't see him. That what they suggest is we can't see him with physical eyes. We can see him with physical eyes, but we can see him, quote unquote, with our spiritual eyes. We can see him with physical eyes, or we can see him with our spiritual eyes, as in, see as in, perceive or understand him. Okay, that see there is perceive him or understand him. Um, whoever who hasn't read yet, Mika, will you please read for us John chapter 6, 45 and 46? John chapter 6, 45 and 46. As it is written in the scriptures, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has ever seen the Father, only I who is sent from God have seen him. Okay, there you go. Not that anyone has seen the Father, only I who was sent from God has seen him. So who was talking? Mika was talking there. It was Jesus, right? Jesus was talking. <laughs> right? it surprised you okay. Jesus talking he said not that anyone has read letter, pastor. yeah there you go <laughs> I've ever seen the father only I who has sent from God is in God. look I want to point something here okay this statement that Jesus has seen the father I believe he was referring to his even his pre-incarnate state pre-incarnate state what do you mean by that that statement was true before he came down to earth. Okay? So what are you, why are you pointing that, Pastor? Why is that necessary for, for me to point out? Because the only time he had human body and human eyes, are you with me? The only time Jesus had a human body having human eyes was when he got incarnated 2,000 years ago. So what did he see God with? He saw God. So what did he see God with? That was the point that some people are saying. What some people are saying is, there is another way to see God. There is another way to see God. Probably a perception, an understanding, an understanding of him that may not necessarily be through the human eyes. Okay? So that's, that's the contention they have. So uh, here are the possibilities. Okay? So we want, the things that I pointed out, we won't see. We won't see the invisible God, not with our physical eyes, but we will see the visible image through our Lord Jesus Christ with our glorified eyes. Okay, because we're going to have a new set of eyes somehow. I don't know how God's going to shift that, that we're able to perceive, understand, and perhaps see uh, Jesus in a different light, in a different way. Uh, and then we'll probably understand better that beautiful image image or mirror image that god the father and jesus had that if, if we see jesus we're seeing the one who lives in an unapproachable light or we will see jesus we will see the invisible god the way jesus saw him the way jesus saw him prior to him coming down to earth how did jesus see the father prior to him coming down to earth with a different way that we may not fully understand him that's how we can see him okay all right so Anybody has any question regarding that? Okay, praise God. We can move on. Praise the Lord. I'm happy there's no question. I may not be able to answer anyway. So it's good. Number two, number two, um, it, you may laugh at this, but for somebody it was important. So I'm going to go through this uh, quickly. This is the question. What's the significance of the folded cloths when Jesus rose from the dead? What was the significance of the folded cloths? Folded cloths or napkins, okay? What was the significance of that? So somebody asked that. Why was it folded? Why did they have to point that out, okay? So let's go to John. Where do you see that? Is that really in the Bible? It was. John 20, verses 3 to 7. May I request... I think you read that one. John 20, 3 to 7. Okay, please go there, John 23 to 7. You there? Yeah. Okay. Okay, John 
20. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. I went to three. Okay. John 20, three to seven. You're a little soft, Mama. Huh? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Is this good? Okay. John 20, chapter. Uh, chapter 20 verses 3 to 7 Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb they were both running but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first he stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there but he didn't go in then Simon Peter arrived and went inside he also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Okay, as I said, you may find this not that important, but there may be some people who find this important as, as like, we may not find it important that John pointed out that he outran Peter, but for him, it was important. It was important. Okay, so uh, th that's that's why we, we, I want to answer this. But that part there in verse seven, which says the cloth that had covered Jesus um, head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Um, that's also translated. That part which just folded up. Uh, it's also translated as wrapped together or rolled up. Okay, so whether it's folded up or wrapped together or rolled up, an effort was made to fix it. Okay, there was an effort. It didn't just like you think about the rapture. It like it just lies down there, right? I, that, that's the reason. Yeah, I remember. I remember a movie. I think it was about. It was one of those the, the more current thief in the night movie or is it left Peter behind. Right? left behind movie that yeah, produced by Peter and Paul Elon where the on, on the rapture situations when the where the people were raptured or caught up in the movie they portrayed that the clothes of the people were folded the clothes of the people were folded and and he was and he was asked uh, do you believe that why did, why, why did you wait why were the clothes of the people raptured folded instead of just like falling down on the floor. He goes, it's not really a dogmatic um, theological position I have. He, he's, he goes, I just found it interesting that in in the one that we read, in John, they literally, they said it was folded up. So he said, so since it's like that when Jesus resurrected, then I found it like, interesting to have the, fold, the clothes of the people raptured folded as well. You know, so that was his reason. So not a dogmatic thing, but it was folded. But what's the significance uh, regarding that? So I, I came up with several. Let's, anybody want to give any opinion? What does it, what do you, what do you think? What was, anybody? And you know what? Yes, We're gonna, I want us to go through this quickly. We may not be able to finish. Does anybody have? Okay. Go ahead, Paul. Did you answer all of them? Huh? So, so are we accepting questions or not? Yes, yes. Okay. No, I was just wondering, if, if you had time to fold the head cloth, why not the other stuff? It was just not enough time or, I don't know. What, what was your question, Paul? What was your question? Like it says that only the, the cloth that was uh, wrapped his head was folded up. Uh -huh. and, apart, and it was lying apart from the other wrappings. Does that mean the other, it sounded like the other wrappings were not folded. So why was just the, or is that not, I guess it's not explicit, but. Uh, it, it's not explicit. Many people understand this. Well, the cloth that I covered you said was folded up and lying apart. Yeah, that's true. Um, the, the, the question that was asked here is why, that's true. Nobody, they didn't ask me that on the Bible study. Why is it that not everybody, that, that all the wrappings were folded? Asked by the, oh. the King James translation. Yeah, what's the King James translation? King James translation says, "And the napkin that was about his about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. They were wrapped together." Okay, but but the head not lying with his. What is it again? Clothes. Yeah, not lying with his linen clothes, right? 
and the napkin uh, that was about his <laughs> not lying with the linen clothes. Sorry. There you go. Now leave it <laughs> the side post question was that, that why is it that there's only the head part was wrapped together, right? So well, every 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 answer here is like that. That makes it even more again the nuance there makes it even a little more interesting, right? Why only that? Okay. So what? Anybody has any opinion? Anybody, whether on the first question or the second follow-up question, like, yeah, the head wrappings were, but the wasn't there part, wasn't there some kind of Jewish custom or something? I can't. No, remember, it wasn't. Like, it wasn't. Yeah. I well, definitely, that, definitely, you, definitely, uh, definitely, the custom. The custom is they are wrapped. They stay wrapped. Oh, I I meant like some <laughs> kind of Jewish custom with um, with like uh. From what I remember, like setting like the dinner table or something like that, um, with the napkin. Um, so that's to... one of the okay, Ryan. I know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Actually, let me see. That's one of the things that I read, but I researched on it. Like, is it something that because it's one of the most one of the most famous um, theories? Well, in fact, for some for some people, it's not a theory. Because they refer to some kind, like what Ryan said, they refer to some kind of Jewish custom regarding regarding um, the, the the napkin on the table again. So, but I'm gonna read I I I'm gonna read to you something that has to do with that. One of the theories is this. Okay, let me read that to you. But but before we go there, before we go there, okay, I I wanna I wanna like point this out again. This they said. Principle of repetition. I want you to. Did you? Many of you guys remember? Um, um, how many of you guys were blessed with Rabbi Zacharias's ministry? Yeah. How many of you have heard him many times? Okay. Do you know when he conducts when he conducts conferences and seminars in schools? He already has a he already has a set number of set. Uh, theological and apologetic ideas that he has prepared that that categorizes the questions of the students, most of the questions of the students, that whatever whatever the the detail of the question is, somehow they would fall in any of those categories that he has already prepared and learned throughout the years. That when a student asks something that may sound so difficult, he knows it only falls to this category. Another student asked a question, falls in this category. That's what I want you to know. That when we're giving you principles when it comes to answering questions about the Bible, uh, I want you to take it to heart because they fall in these categories. Like, for example, regarding this, the principle of Bible interpretation that I'd like to share to you is that the question is, why is it that this was rolled and that one was not? Why was it even rolled in the first place? What was the significance? So the principle is, if the Bible does not have anything to say directly about it, every interpretation is just an interpretation. You got it, right? If the Bible doesn't have an explicit statement for the reason why it was folded, then every interpretation remains an interpretation. They said this reason, I don't know if there's going to be a wrong answer here, unless it's really way, way off. You know, it's not even connected. There's no coherence. but um, or correspondence, but if your if your answer is okay, somehow related to this, then you may be right. But it remains an interpretation as well. So that's the first one. It's just going to be an interpretation. Um, but the one that Ryan was saying, let me see. Okay, here we go. I, I'll do, I'm just going to read this part to you, so I'm not going to go elaborate on that or make a commentary. This is what it says. Okay, remember regarding the Jewish custom. Okay, it says. To under, in order to understand the significance of the folded napkin, we need to understand a little bit about the Hebrew tradition of that day. The folded napkin had to do with the master and servant, and every Jewish boy knew this tradition. When the servant set the dinner table for the master, he made sure that it was exactly the way the master wanted it. The table was furnished perfectly, and then the servant would wait just out of sight until the master had finished eating. The servant would not dare touch the table until the master was finished. Now, 
If the master was finished eating, he would rise from the table, wipe his finger and mouth, clean his beard, and wet up the napkin and toss it onto the table. The servant would then know the clear, to clear the table. But in those days, the wetted napkin meant, I'm coming back. Okay? I'm coming back. So, so let us be reminded. So that's what it says, right? Um, but uh, when I was reading this, I saw some, some, some comments as well where it says, number one, there's nothing like, there's no known, because according to this, every Jewish boy knew the tradition. A writing, I believe it may be a Jewish person writing, it goes, it's not something that Jewish people know. Like, it's like, no, not every Jewish, not every Jewish people know about this tradition. And then it goes, and plus the fact that it does not have anything to do with a burial cloth. It has something to do with the napkins on the table which would be, even if it was true, it would be very different. Um, and then my own observation was, my own observation was, uh, if that was true, that we should not be touching that because the master was going to come back, but we don't have the cloth anymore. Somehow we touched it. You know, since people touch it. And so will that lose the symbolism of him coming back still? So there are many questions regarding that. Okay, but... Um, question huh? question a poem. Which you, you have the follow up question? No, no, okay. no plus, then I will add, and I will add Paul's, uh, Paul's question. question as an answer to that one about the theory about the coming back Jewish custom, which is why did not, why did, if, if the folding is a reflection of coming back and the body part was not folded? Was Jesus confused with whether he was coming back or not? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But it, you know what I'm talking about. There's like almost there's no consistency there as well. So I, I don't know. I all of these are theories, probably because the body part was important. But one thing that I saw though is because somehow there are people who believe that even if the um, even if the one that was pointed out that was folded is only the head part. Somehow there's a common understanding. I, I would not say common, but there are some who understand it as everything was folded. Everything was folded. That's the reason why even the Shroud of Turin um, theory, they believe that it was really Jesus Christ because somehow the way it was, yeah, the way it was folded. Um, that may be another theory, Paul. That may be another theory is because the body part, the way it was folded in the beginning anyway, was already very orderly. Said that there was no need anymore to fold it. You know what I'm saying? So that may be it. Probably the, the head part was the the head part was the harder thing to to fix. So I'm not sure. So but that's those are again, those are all theories. The significance of that, nobody knows. One thing that I know, God is a God of order. Um yeah, that may be it. Or there's another person, I'll, I'll end with this. There's another person who actually suggested that that somehow it was a statement that. So it may be a possible statement that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was not a rushed, unplanned thing. It was, a, it was not a rushed, unplanned thing. Jesus did not rush away from that tomb. Okay, he took time. He took time. I mean, to say it was like he was not escaping somebody. He was not afraid of anybody. Everything was a part of the plan. So that all theories, all theories. Okay. So. I, I'm going to cut here because I want to spend, I know I know it's already time, but I want to spend time praying also. So I'm going to return it to Oh, people are raising their hands. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, <clears throat> Also, a question, a question also on, um, like, thieves. You know how uh, people would propose that the body of Christ was stolen? Yeah. So, I don't know, maybe it's partly because why would thieves fold, fold the head part? <laughs> there you go. For, 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 us, for us, it's a beautiful, <laughs> for, us, it's a, for us, it's a beautiful item of apologetic. Like, see, yeah. It, yeah, it dislodges that um, thieves stole his body theory. 
<laughs> Why would the thieves take time to fall that part, right? <laughs> well, actually, if the thieves are so nice, they were actually going to fold both, but then the guards came, so it <laughs> just only folded. It just only folded the face part <laughs> because they heard, they heard the woman's steps. Yeah, yeah, Jayla. Oh, I just, I don't know, I, maybe a question, but I was reading that traditionally the shroud is one piece. Mm. It's one piece that just is to cover the whole body, no zippers, no um, pockets, so that it, um, it's just to preserve, it doesn't reveal that the person was rich or poor, or nobody can put anything in or out of it. So I don't know what the significance, if, why, then it's... Yeah or if it's two different pieces right right the, thank you thank you for pointing that out see the thing regarding the thing regarding uh, the writings about tradition is is we're, we're not living in that era it, because there are there are many accounts regarding traditional practices that do contradict each other like that one there's a there's that's why the mummy where right? you see the mummy mummy fine it's it's all in one cloth, you know what I'm saying? It's like wrapping, they can toilet paper wrap around you, like but cloth, right? But uh, at the same time, if you if you look at the shot of Turin, the way they described the way it was folded on the person was actually not wrapped, but just folded on top of the person. And they also proved that traditionally, that's how they wrap people and bury people. So there are different accounts as to how they would wrap them traditionally. and. Um, it, even in the verse that we read, somehow it implied it implied that there was a separation between the one that wrapped his head and the other part. That's why there's a uh, there was a description about the other part, the other part wrapping, except as opposed to um, the head wrapping. That's why Paul. That's why Paul was able to come up with the question. Okay, but thank you though. Yeah, so yeah, different. It's hard to. It's really hard to point out. Perhaps we could probably take it as. Traditionally, there were different ways of wrapping people, you know, because according to the Shad of Turin, this was the way it was wrapped. According to this verse, it was separated, and according to other traditional account, it's it's all one body, which is, again, we understand the mummifying um, of, of uh, the dead people before. Okay, they do that as well. Okay, thank, thank you, though, for those. Okay, so I'm returning it to Abibao. All right.